So Venezuela is an interesting case because it had the highest per capita income in Latin America in 1970, and it was uh, the country with the largest degree of economic freedom. Uh, you can measure that. Uh, the Fraser Institute in Canada does that work of measuring economic freedom. And in 1970, Venezuela was uh, 14th, uh, 14 in the world in terms of economic freedom. It was about like 90 countries, more or less, that they were measuring back then. Um, Chile was one of the last countries because we had had the socialist experiment of Salvador Allende, which was an attempt to impose a totalitarian communist system in Chile. And we were last in the country and we had hyperinflation and scarcity of basic goods and services and so on and so forth. So it was a complete catastrophe that ended up in the coup of 1973 led by General Pinochet. But Venezuela over time and over the decades, especially after they nationalized in the 70s the oil industry, we have to remember Venezuela has one of the largest oil reserves in the world. Um, they nationalized it and uh, they started falling in the ranking of economic freedom systematically. So by the time Chavez came to power in 1988, Venezuela was doing very poorly in the rankings of economic freedom. You had a very kleptocratic, kleptocratic corrupt uh, system that, um, you know, a rent-seeking society, let's say, everyone was trying to live out of the government hand handouts and, and corrupt deals between the corporate interests and the politicians. And uh, Chavez was uh, elected. He had been a, a, milit a soldier who had attempted a coup in 1992 against Carlos Andres Perez. So, so he was a golpista, what we call a golpista in Spanish. So uh, someone who tried to overthrow a democratically elected president uh, and install a, a, a dictatorship. So everyone knew who Chavez was. Many people died in 1992 and he ended up in prison. But um, well-meaning center leftist in uh, Venezuela uh, pardoned him so he could go out of jail. And then he went to see Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro recognized immediately that he had, um, you know, a puppet that he could guide in order to, to take control over Venezuela. So Castro and Cuba, they have been the masterminds behind what is going on uh, in this country. And they have, um, you know, extracted huge sums of wealth from Venezuela uh, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, at some point, Russia stopped funding uh, Cuban, the Cuban dictatorship. And so Venezuela uh, played that role. And, and Chavez had saw in Fidel Castro a fatherly figure for him. And uh, this is really an important uh, thing because he was loyal to Fidel until the very end. And the intelligence services from Cuba, who are very effective, we, we have to say, um, in consolidating power, they have been there in Cuba for over 60 years, so they know what they're doing. These are the people advising the regime as to what to do to deal with the opposition and to purge the military and things like that. Um, but Venezuela was already um, in a situation where they have where they have lost um, their economic freedom and their per capita incomes, as compared to other countries in Latin America, started to fall dramatically. And while Chile embraced free market reforms, uh, especially influenced by the Chicago School of Economics, Milton Friedman and Arnold Harberger, George Stigler, and people like that, and we became the wealthiest country in per capita terms in Latin America. And um, so you can see that uh, in the 70s, Chile was at the bottom of the economic freedom ranking. We went up to the top, even top 10 at some point, and we became the wealthiest country in Latin America. And Venezuela, the complete opposite. They went from being the freest country in Latin America to now the last country in the ranking in the world, 162 among 162 countries that are measured. And it's a complete disaster 